When did you decide to become a philosopher? When did that idea first occur to you? Well, I, I never really decided. I've always been interested in philosophical questions, and even in high school, I thought of myself as having more intellectual interest than most of my fellow classmates. Uh, it wasn't really until I got to Oxford uh, that I began to think maybe I could do this professionally. I wanted uh, to have some sort of intellectual career, but I wasn't sure I was good enough to be a philosopher professionally, and I, it wasn't clear to me that I could succeed professionally. It wasn't until after I finished my BA, and in Oxford in those days, you could get a job with a BA, so I became a lecturer at Christchurch, my college, basically a year after I finished my bachelor's degree. So then I was off and running. Then I knew this is going to be a career for me. So essentially, I was 23 years old when I knew that this was going to be my profession, but by the time I was 13, I knew I had intellectual interests. So you had gone from uh, studying at the University of Wisconsin straight over to Oxford. Yes. Where you continued to study right through your, your PhD? Well, it's not a PhD. It's a DPhil. I got a doctor, an Oxford doctorate degree. A real doctorate of philosophy. Well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was it like, though, to go from the Midwest, a good university, to the august uh, surroundings of Oxford, which was really the seat of a certain tradition of philosophy with some big Well, names. yeah, it was. But uh, the problems I had with uh, Oxford were not intellectual. Uh, the problems were that it was just physically impossible to live. The buildings were unheated. The food was no good. Uh, the British were still on wartime rationing, so you couldn't get any decent food. You got one egg a week, and they never told you in advance which breakfast the egg would be served at, so I never... I didn't usually get it. There was hardly any meat. So it, it was just generally difficult to live. Uh, the, the problem I had was not with the intellectual level. I liked the intellectual level of Oxford. And there was a, what I liked best about it was there was an enormous amount of intellectual activity going on, especially in philosophy. In a, most American universities, the philosophy department is fairly small. Well, in Oxford, it's the biggest department in the university. When I was an undergraduate, there were 65 professional philosophers in Oxford, and there are probably more than that now. Now, I don't know any university in America that has that many, so it just meant there was a lot of philosophical activity going on. Also, there was an enormous amount of interest in philosophy among undergraduate students, and I fell in with a bunch of people where we talked philosophy all the time. So it wasn't intimidating, though? Um, well, was... not really, no. I was never scared of Oxford. No. Mm -hmm. I I just can imagine you know an American going over there and the, the the British tradition you know seeming kind of severe and all those analytic philosophers ready to catch you out in any error is my is my uh, preconception wrong? Yeah, but I I never really had a problem uh, <laughs> with those guys. Um, I got on well with them and uh, they were interested in what I had to say and often critical of certain things. Uh, particularly if they didn't like the manner in which I expressed something, but that was helpful. I didn't mind being told that, uh, uh, that, that some form of expression I had used was unclear. I was welcomed that. Were you already forming your own personal theories that differed from those, say, of the orthodoxy at that time, if there was one? Well, everybody talked about the orthodoxy of Oxford, but I never could find much of an orthodoxy. They were just too many different people with too many different types of opinions. So there was always a lot of debate going on. And remember, I started all this when I was 20 years old, so I didn't really have a well-formed philosophical theory about most issues. I was open to all these ideas, and I just soaked up what I could. And uh, when people said something I disagreed with, I pointed out my disagreements. And at first, I said, all these famous guys, if I point out my disagreements, they'd think you're just missing the point. Uh, but they didn't say that. No, they seemed quite interested in what I had to say. And so um, I kept on arguing and they kept on responding. Um, when did you come to the to the strong conviction that you still have and that figures prominently in your new book, Seeing Things As They Are, A Theory of Perception, that philosophy took a wrong turn uh, about 400 years ago with Descartes and has yeah. been kind of on a dead end ever since. Well, I wouldn't say a dead end, but philosophy took some famous wrong turns. And one wrong turn was when Descartes changed the fundamental questions of philosophy from theological questions uh, to questions about knowledge. And Descartes' central question was, how is knowledge possible? And how can we answer a skeptical doubts about the possibility of knowledge? 
Now, by itself, that's no bad, not so bad, but Descartes also made another um, a turn which was characteristic of philosophers of that era. Uh, Locke had exactly the same uh, mistake, and that is the assumption that you don't really uh, perceive objects and states of affairs in the world directly. All you can directly perceive are your own experiences. You perceive all of these uh, ideas, as uh, Descartes and Locke uh, call them. Uh, ideas in your mind, that's what you directly perceive. And then there's a question, what's the relationship between the ideas that you can perceive and the objects and states of affairs in the world that you can't perceive? Now, that's a disaster because once you get the theory that you can't actually see uh, chairs and tables but only see your own ideas of chairs and tables, then skepticism becomes unanswerable. Then you haven't got an answer to the question, well, how the hell do you know there's a chair there if you can't see it? All you can see is your own image of it. That's a mistake. That mistake, by the way, survives. There are a lot of people who still believe that, and indeed especially in the sciences. A lot of scientists think that the science has shown that you don't see the real world. What you see is the stuff in your head, which is produced by the impact of the real world. That's a, that was a disastrous mistake in the 17th century, and it's a disastrous mistake today. Uh, the idea that um, we are sitting in kind of a windowless room and we get occasional reports of what's out there and try to figure out what's going on beyond our skull. But worse than that, we're sitting in a windowless room watching a movie of the real world. And then the question is, well, how do you know the movie corresponds to anything in reality? And the answer that you're forced to, in the, I think, in the case of Descartes and Locke is, well, you don't really know. Descartes had to make some desperate moves. He had to say, well, the reason that we can be confident is otherwise God would be deceiving us. Uh, and, and he couldn't deceive us. So what we clearly and distinctly perceive we to, must be true. That's a desperate answer, and it's not a satisfactory answer. Um, I have to confess that as a freshman studying philosophy uh, and reading the Critique of Pure Reason, I fell under the spell of that idea yeah. pretty powerfully for a long time. I, I'm wondering, did you ever believe it, or, or when did you start? I never believed yeah. in the, the rejection of a naive realist theory of perception. Realism is the view that you actually see objects and states of affairs in the world, at least most of the time. Sometimes you have hallucinations or delusions of various kinds. But when I hold up my hand in front of my face and count the five fingers, I really see the real hand. I, a Kant would have to say, I see the hand in itself. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. But as you point out, Kant didn't think that. He thought you couldn't see things in themselves. All you could ever see are your own representations. So there are a no, number of famous disasters in the history of philosophy. We've mentioned three, Descartes, Locke, and Kant. But there are other disasters as well. And one of the disastrous features of the 400 years, or let's say 300, yeah, uh, we're getting close to 400 years after Descartes, uh, is the idea that you never actually directly perceive the real world. All you can ever perceive are the contents of your own mind. And then somehow there, you have to infer the presence of objects from what you can actually perceive, which are the ideas in your own mind. Now, uh, uh, Barclay looked at that picture and thought, that's crazy. Uh, really, all there are in the world is, is minds and ideas. There isn't any real world the other side of minds and ideas. If there were, you could never know it. All you can ever know are the contents of your own mind. So Barclay and Hume took us out of the frying pan and into the fire. These guys said, well, you can kind of, the earlier guys said, you can indirectly know about the real world because you can infer that there's a desk over there from the fact that you see an image of a desk. But uh, Barclay said, well, that's all a desk is. It's a bunch of images. It's just a bunch of ideas. There's nothing there but a bunch of ideas. That's even crazier. And that, I, I don't think many people believe that, but that did have a long uh, influential period. It's called phenomenalism, the idea that objects just really are collections of experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it true that uh, Samuel Johnson said, I refute it thus by yeah, pointing at a rock? If you can believe Boswell, um, <laughs> uh, he, he's supposed to refute it by kicking a rock. But that doesn't refute to Barclay. Barclay would say, well, of course, when you kick the rock, what you have is a pain in your toe. And that's all the rock consists in is a set of experiences, including the pain in your toe. Well, by the time we're done, John, I think the title of this interview could be John Searle Refutes It Thus. That's right. But um, I think you got to do more uh, for Barclay than just kick stones. You have to analyze <laughs> what was the mistake. And the mistake was the basic mistake of supposing uh, that uh, realism is about perception is false, that realism is the view that you actually some of the time see and perceive objects themselves, the th as Kant says, the thing in itself. I think that happens all the time.
When I put on my shoes this morning, I really perceived my real shoes and my real feet, and I put uh, the one onto the other, and that really happened. Uh, there's no room for uh, skepticism given the character of the experience I had. Um, you mentioned the dismissive term for your point of view uh, earlier, which is naive realism. Right. Are yeah. you okay with that being well, naive? Well, uh, naive. I, I like to use that because it offends uh, people. But uh, naive realism I, I, uh, comes in different versions, some of which are incoherent. On one version, well, really, the reason that you can see uh, objects is the object is actually part of the experience. Uh, so it's, I, the, I, and I don't think you can make sense of that. You have to make a distinction between the experience in my head and the object that the experience is of. So the experience gives me direct knowledge of the object, but the object isn't in my head. So there, there are mistaken versions of naive realism. But on my view, it just says you directly perceive objects. Uh, there's no inference involved as there is in representative realism, uh, and there's no extra hypothesis involved. It's just a fact about your normal experience when you're looking at your hand or putting on your shoes that you directly perceive objects and states of affairs in the world, and that's a version of direct realism that I call naive realism. Well, you know the objection, and you've heard it a billion times, but I'm going to restate it here for the sake of conversation. Wait a minute. You don't have the object in your head, just as you said. What you have is the end result of a long process of transmission that begins when light reflects off the object and lands on your retina and then gets yeah. uh, the data gets shuffled over into the back of your brain and the visual processing center, and you reconstruct an image, by the way, with a lot of assumptions and a lot of prior knowledge built in, mm -hmm. all kinds of conditioning and all of that. It's not just the pure data that you're dealing with. So what about all that intermediate stuff and yeah. all that conditional stuff? Okay. No, I, I agree uh, that uh, that's how I see objects. Uh, the way I see objects is they reflect light waves and the, the reflection, the stimulus of the the, the photons stimulate the, the uh, photoreceptor cells in the retina, and eventually this produces a visual experience. I think that's absolutely right. That's what makes it possible for me to see objects at all. The important thing to see, and this is the decisive point, you don't see the visual experience. Whenever you see anything consciously, you have a visual experience, but you can't see the visual experience. Not because it's invisible, but because it is the seeing. One thing you can't see when you see anything is the seeing of that thing. You see the thing, and in seeing uh, the thing, an experience occurs, which I'm calling the seeing of the thing, but you can't see the seeing. Now, there's a task for vision science to explain, well, how does that seeing occur? And that occurs, as you described, by a set of neurobiological processes beginning with the photoreceptor cells and going right through until eventually it produces a conscious visual experience. The key point that has to be emphasized over and over is you can't see the visual experience. When you see anything, you have a visual experience, you don't see it. Right. Well, experientially, I would agree. I'm looking at you right now, and I'm not seeing the, the seeing. Um, I can sort of examine it. I yeah. can sort of examine say what's in my about it. Yeah, yeah, I can say things about it. Close your eyes and ask what stopped. That's but it, the visual experience. There you go. But experientially, or what you call phenomenologically, it is an immediate, direct sensation, no doubt about it. Yeah. But what about all that intermediate stuff that tells us there's been a translation that went on between whatever physical object is out there yeah. and my you know, visual cortex? Yeah. What about it? That is to say. So how's that direct? Uh, there's a whole lot of processes, as you say, beginning with the photoreceptor cells, and they're actually quite complex processes. You left out uh, the optic chiasma and the lateral geniculate nucleus and the various visual areas. Yeah, I just didn't want to complicate uh, uh, things. Uh, complicate it, <laughs> yes, and you have to have processes in all of those. And now, according to some accounts, uh, there are certain systematic uh, illusions produced by those processes on some accounts. We shouldn't think of objects as actually being colored. Rather, for the object to be red is just for us to be able for it to produce a certain experience like this experience, which I call the experience of red. So there is a there are a set of processes by which the brain produces the conscious visual experience, and some of those processes give us an accurate account of how things are in the world and others do not. And that's an interesting question in both science and philosophy. Certain types of illusions are built in to the structure of the visual system. You can't avoid having these illusions. Escher made a career out of doing these systematically deceptive pictures. 
But I think that's a further contribution to the discussion. That doesn't create any philosophical catastrophes. It just tells us, yes, of course, we see the world the way uh, we do because we're, we are the sort of beings we are. The world is the way it is, and it's a complex interaction between the way the world is and the way we are that produces the visual experience. Have you seen the famous, uh, what color is this dress puzzle? I have. Puzzle? Yeah, it drives me crazy. That's a wonderful example, and I need to think about it some more. I just saw it on the web, but I, I, haven't, I don't have an analysis of it. I look at it, and I know exactly what color it is. It's just that the other people who work in my office see something completely different. <laughs> what do you I see? wonder about their eyesight. <laughs> what do you see? I've forgotten which, okay. which it was, but I, it was quite distinct from what my assistants say they see. Um, just for any listeners who haven't yet seen this viral image that's gone all over the internet uh, for the last couple of months, it's a picture of a, a dress that has horizontal stripes. And uh, depending on who you are uh, and what mood you're in, you might see them as gold and white or as blue and black. Or in my case, and I've never run into anybody else who sees what I see, a kind of light blue and gold. But the account of this from uh, cognitive psychologists is that the brain is making an assumption about the lighting. And different brains are assuming different lighting conditions and therefore yeah. seeing different colors, which is proof yeah. that color is not intrinsic in the object. Yeah. It's something that we deduce from yeah. all kinds of cues. Yeah. So again, this gets me back to the big question about your uh, <laughs> claim that we see the object directly. Yeah. I see Help that. us understand oh, what directly it's just a means. a picture on the uh, screen, yeah. uh, but I do see it directly. What, uh, you ask, what does directly mean? It means I don't see it by way of seeing something else first. Uh, so, for example, if I see an image of myself in a mirror, I see my face indirectly by seeing a mirror image. But when I see you right now, I don't see a mirror image. I see your face directly. So there are various indirect ways of seeing things. The mistake in the philosophical tradition is to say all perception is indirect by way of first perceiving what's in your mind mm. and then inferring the presence of an object. That I reject. And as you said, uh, science has accepted that idea because the account of the visual system we just talked about tells us that a picture is pretty much constructed in the head and then someone in there has to look at it. Yeah, that's a well-known <laughs> fallacy called the homunculus fallacy. <laughs> yeah. uh, that perception occurs because there's a little guy in our head looking at a TV screen and uh, the world puts an image on the TV screen. Uh, but the problem with that is, what about a guy looking at the TV screen? Does he have a visual, does he have a TV screen in his head? <laughs> so this is called the homunculus fallacy, where homunculus means little man or little person. Uh, and the idea is that, well, all of our cognition occurs because there's a little person in the head doing the cognizing, and that won't do. That leads to an infinite regress. Because you'd have to have, if the little person does what we do, then you'd have to have a little person inside the little person, and so on down the line. Uh, so the correct account, I think, is, as I said earlier, typically in a perceptual per situation, you directly perceive objects and states of affairs in the world. Directly means you don't see anything first by way of which you see. You don't see pictures, images, ideas, impressions, uh, etc. Um, so this puts you on the side, I think, of most every human being on Earth, Except I don't for the think philosophers. Most people think about this. Right. No, I think <laughs> my experience with the students in philosophy, they never thought about this before. And they can easily become convinced by the standard philosophical mistake. They're easily convinced that, well, no, you don't really see objects. What you see is what's going on in your head. What you see is what stops when you close your eyes. That's a very deep mistake. It's easy to make it. And it's, as I said earlier, one of the great disasters in the history of philosophy. But I do think people listening to this who haven't been trained in philosophy are saying, what's the big deal? That's exactly how I thought it was all along, really? right? That, well, that we directly I, I see hope the world. they're naive realists, yeah. but most people don't think about this at all. And if you go to the professionals, most of the professionals, well, I don't know now, but I mean, maybe I'm having some good effect. But uh, in the history of this, I mean, most of the professionals have denied naive realism. They thought one thing we can refute is naive realism. We can show that you can't see objects. Uh, all you can see is the impact of the object on your visual system. Well, it's obviously a little more complicated than our quick summary has made it out to be because your proof has, or your argument has many aspects to it. Yeah, sure. Can you give us a really simplified version of how you explain our direct access to these things? Oh, there are several different uh, versions. Uh, the simplest thing is to explain what happens when you actually see something. And what happens when you actually see something is uh, that the 
object in question stimulates your nervous system so as to produce a visual experience of that very object. I now have a visual experience of you. My visual experience is directed at you. Now, that's the simplest story. Now, typically, if you're going to talk about this in terms of the history, you have to answer certain traditional objections. And the standard objection has got a name. It's called the argument from illusion. And the way the argument goes in, well, there are many different versions, but the standard version goes as follows. Suppose it was a hallucination. Suppose there was no object there. What do you see then? And now this is the crucial point, again, in the history of philosophy. Making the false move here is a disaster. The correct answer to the question in a hallucination is you don't see anything. I look at my hand in front of my face. Suppose it's a hallucination. The experience is exactly the same in the hallucinatory case and in the non-hallucinatory case. Yes, but all the same in the, in the good case. In the veridical case, I see my hand. But in the hallucination case, I don't see anything. It's a, that's what makes it a hallucination. There's nothing there to see. The mistake in the history of philosophy, and this really is a disastrous mistake, is to suppose that if the experiences are the same, you can't tell the difference between the experience in the good case and the bad case. If the experiences are the same, then you must see the same thing in both cases. That's wrong. In one case, you see an object. In the other case, you don't see anything. That's what made it hallucinations. You didn't see anything. Now, to determine that, you'd have to go outside of the head of the experiencer. Well, and... you got. there are ways we check whether or yeah. not you're having a hallucination. <laughs> I mean, it's not uh, <laughs> impossible to find out. I, I, people talk about hallucinations. I've never had a hallucination. But I think it wouldn't be very hard to find out that it was a hallucination if I did have a hallucination. Well, what about a milder version of that problem, which is not a hallucination, but really just a radically different experience from someone else looking at the same yeah. object. Well, that you, happens all the time. And you both have direct access yeah. to that object, so why is there any difference? I mean, there are all kinds of cases where two different people uh, will have different experiences. Push one eyeball and everything looks double. Uh, or, there, or just have a lot to drink and things start to look a bit fuzzy. So there are all sorts of ways of interfering with your perceptual system so as to affect the actual structure of the visual experience or other type of sensory experience. Uh, but all the same, what follows? It doesn't follow that you never see objects in states of affairs. What these guys want to do is draw a conclusion that doesn't follow. Namely, the argument goes, the possibility of illusion, hallucination, delusion, etc., shows that you never see anything real. You never see anything in the real world. And that's wrong. It doesn't follow. Yes, there are these uh, all these ways in which uh, perceptions can be in varying respects imperfect or even different from one person to another, but it doesn't follow that you don't see the real world. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, as you said, with the the whole path that uh, Descartes and maybe some others started us down is once you establish that there are two different things, completely separate things, the object in itself and the perception of the object, the phenomenon, whatever you yeah. want to call it. Once you, then you have a very hard time establishing anything about necessary relation between the two, yeah. and pretty soon you're doubting that anything exists other than ideas, like Bishop yeah. Barclay. Well, I don't think you are if you do it right. But now you have now we get a theory. Now you you have to introduce a theoretical point. We haven't said any really anything theoretically no. uh, presumptuous so far because now we've said okay, there is a visual experience in the head. There's an object out there. The object causes the visual experience. What's the relation between the two? And here I have to introduce a technical term, and that is the notion of intentionality, of what, the fact that the mind is about things in the world. It has no special connection with intending. We use this word because we got it from the Germans, and it's like a lot of bad philosophical terms. It's, we got it from the Germans, and it's confusing. But intentionality just means directedness. Okay, now my visual experience is intrinsically and essentially direct. Directed. It's about something. It's of something. And that means it can succeed or fail. It's going to be right or wrong. If hallucination is case is a failure, the a good case where I'm seeing things, uh, it really is not a failure. So we have to introduce another technical term to describe these success and failure. And I introduce the notion of conditions of success or conditions of satisfaction. So I see my hand in front of my face then at least part of the condition of satisfaction is there's got to be a hand there. And that's the part of the relation between the visual experience and the object. 
is the presence and features of the object are the condition of satisfaction of the intentionality of the visual experience. Now, that sounds like a mouthful, but the ideas are basically simple. And if you understand that, you'll understand more than most professional philosophers because a lot of them just don't get this. It's not circular, though. No, it's not circular at all. You start with objects in the world, and you recognize that you have experiences in your head. What's the relation between them? The relationship be is that the experience in the head is directed at the object. That is to say, its condition of satisfaction are that there has to be an object there. And if there really is one, then you're getting it right. Then your experience is, as they say, veridical. It's not true. analogous to true. It's a, a case of truth for experiences as it is truth for statements. Um, this interdependency between the experience and the object, uh, I think, goes even further. We're, we're, again, talking about something you lay out in your new book, Seeing Things as They Are, A Theory of Perception. And later in the book, you ask what makes the quality of the object yeah. Uh, what it is. Yeah. And your answer is? Well, that's not a trivial question. And I, I doubt if we can go into much detail on the radio, but I'll tell you the basic, the bare bones, and that's this. Perception is hierarchical. Uh, so I don't just see a car, but I see that it's my car. And I don't just see uh, that it's my car. I see that it's a car that has a certain shape and a certain color, and it's a car of a certain uh, a, a make and a certain year. Now, the, the perceptual hierarchy bottoms out in things that you can perceive without perceiving anything else by way of which you perceive them, and those are things like color and shape. Okay, let's take color as our example. Then the way that the character of the visual experience relates to the color of the object is part of what it is for an object to be, for example, red, or for an object to be blue is for it to be able to cause this sort of visual experience, to, as we would say in ordinary speech, to look like this. So a red object is one that looks like this, and that sounds like common sense, but the way that it's theoretically important is that it's being red consists in the ability to produce this kind of experiences in people who have a good vision and are otherwise not defective or not in bad light or not drunk or, or not deceived by various um, mechanisms of deception. So you get a, a kind of logical connection between the features of the object and the character of the experience, and that's what enables the experience to give you information about that object. So a red object is an object that can produce the sensation of red in yeah. me. Yeah, I don't. It's not really a sensation, but it's an experience. Experience of red. Yeah. And again, that's not circular. No, no, no. Red object is defined as an object that produces experiences like this, and we know that from experience. And it's those uh, experiences that enable us to distinguish red objects from other sorts of objects. But the account isn't circular because we're not just saying, well, red objects look red. That's true. But what we are trying to get at is what is it about this particular experience that makes it the case that that experience presents a red object to us in virtue of its features? And the answer is there's a conceptual connection between its having those features and its ability to cause this type of experience. What about that dress? Uh, what kind of object is it? Well, I haven't I thought about that <laughs> enough, and I'm not sure I believe the accounts I read in the press. Uh, because I know what color it is, and I can't get anybody else to agree with me. Uh, it's silver and uh, gold. And there are all sorts of people who disagree with that. So I, I need to study it more or either have their head examined. Uh, this is a good time to introduce another distinction and, and really a, a version of a distinction that we're all familiar with and that conditions a lot of these discussions. Um, and that is between subjective and objective. Yeah. Uh, and you have a particular way of describing that distinction between our inner world yeah, and the outer right. world. Well, the notion of subjective and objective, again, are massively confused in philosophy, but the basic uh, distinction we want is between uh, those entities whose existence depend on being experienced by a human or animal subject. Pains and tickles and itches are subjective, and to have a fancy word, I say they're ontologically subjective where ontology means having to do with existence. They exist because we experience they them. They exist only because we experience them. And that they is exist to say, in our experience that's of That's right. They, yeah. Their very existence requires that they exist as experienced. Otherwise, they don't exist. That's ontological subjectivity. 
However, there are objects and states of affairs in the world, mountains and molecules and tectonic plates and trees and flowers, and they have an ontologically objective existence. Now, the interest of this distinction from our point of view is that the ontologically objective world around me causes in me a set of ontologically subjective experiences. So I have a subjective visual field in my head and this subjective visual field it gives me information about the objective visual field in the real world. So that's, again, if you understand that, you'll understand more than most professional philosophers, but I think the idea is not very hard. I think it's an easy concept. Now, it's complicated by the fact that there's another sense of the objective-subjective distinction where it's about claims. It's what I call the epistemic sense. Uh, so a claim is epistemically objective if you can settle its truth. Rembrandt was born in 1606. I don't know if that's true, but it is an objective claim. You can settle it. But if I say Rembrandt's the greatest Dutch painter that ever lived, well, that's a matter of, as they say, subjective opinion. So that's epistemically subjective, where epistemic means having to do with knowledge. So in addition to the ontological distinction between objectivity and subjectivity, you have to have an epistemic distinction. Now, why is that such a big deal? Why am I spending so much time on it? And the answer is a very simple and very important. The fact that a domain is ontologically subjective doesn't mean that you can't have an epistemically objective science of that domain. Uh, this is an important point because when I first got interested in this, a lot of neuroscientists would say to me, well, we can't have a science of consciousness because consciousness is subjective and science is objective. Now, that's a beautiful example of a fallacy, a fallacy of ambiguity. Science is indeed epistemically objective, no question. We're trying to get objective truths. But there's nothing about the epistemic objectivity of scientific claims that prevents those claims from being about a domain that's ontologically subjective. So to put it in words of one syllable, you can have a science of consciousness, even though consciousness is ontologically subjective and science is epistemically objective. Yeah, I'm going to run through that one more time because radio, of course... Uh, yeah, you know, it's hard it was... to do it without a blackboard. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, it's, it's pretty basic. I mean... Yeah, it is absolutely fundamental. Yeah. yeah, we're saying that uh, ontologically, meaning it has to do with being or existence, and yeah. there are things that are ontologically subjective, which means they exist because I experience them. They exist as experiences yeah. internally. They are available only to me, and yours are only available to you, and so on. Right. Outside of us is the ontologically objective world that is available and accessible to all of us, uh, and those are two different kinds of domains. Meanwhile, there's this uh, business of uh, epistemically objective, which means it's a fact that we can all ascertain, yeah. whereas epistemically subjective is a fact that is purely our own personal Matters judgment. Yeah. yeah. So corn is a vegetable. That's epistemically objective. Corn tastes good. That's epistemically subjective. Exactly. But your um, bold claim really goes beyond that. It is that, again, you can investigate things objectively that happen to be ontologically subjective, that Absolutely. exist only in our have, heads. You can have an epistemically objective science of a domain that is ontologically subjective. And to put this down to actual cases, yeah, uh, people who think you can't have a science of consciousness don't realize that these neurologists, they have to deal with real patients who suffer real pains. You go to any medical bookstore, go to the neurology section, and you will find epistemically objective accounts of pain. Pain is ontologically subjective. But these doctors can't worry about philosophy. They got to get on and try to help their patients. The patient is suffering. So when they say, well, one cause of pain is our stimulation of the uh, A delta fibers and another type of pain is stimulation of the C fibers, those are epistemically objective claims about the causes of an ontologically subjective sequence of events, namely pains. But you got to do this. You, you will not be able to help people suffering from pain if you don't try to get a science of pain. And that's what the uh, neurobiologists try to do. Um, so a uh, neurologist or some other medical practitioner trying to deal with pain describes the physical causes. Um, they discover that there's some inflammatory process in your knee that's causing you to hurt. But are they investigating the ontologically subjective part yeah, of that, which sure is the experience if you, of pain? If you read the accounts, they will say things like, 
A, delta fiber pains uh, tend to be sharp, stabbing pains. And this uh, partly has to do with the fact that the axons are myelinated, uh, so they, I won't go into the details of, of the anatomy, but they transmit the signal much more efficiently mm -hmm. and much more rapidly. C fiber pains uh, tend to be much more matters of burning and aching sensation. Throbbing. yeah. But the C fiber pains uh, can be more distressing because they activate more of the nervous system. Now, in the uh, brief account I just gave you, I moved from the uh, the mental to the physical effortlessly. There's no metaphysical problem about saying uh, C fiber uh, pains can be distressing because uh, they uh, involve uh, large areas of the nervous system. That's just these are just facts about the physiology and the relation between the anatomy and the phenomenology between the experience you have. So in real life, we don't have these philosophical worries. We have to figure out how it actually works, and you can make epistemically objective claims about a domain that's ontologically subjective like pain. And you'd better, or you won't be able to treat your patients. There is one difference, though, between the observable causes of the pain and the pain itself, and that is that the doctor can maybe produce an image of the inflamed you know, yeah. joint, whereas they have to trust one person and one person only, or at least one yeah. at a time, when it comes to describing the actual feeling of the pain. Yeah. Is that a problem for science? Well, yeah, you have to. Uh, it's especially a problem if you're investigating animals because they can't <laughs> talk. Yeah. Um, but uh, you have to rely on the reports of your patients. But the general patients can be pretty reliable about things like pains. Of course, they uh, suffer self-deception and illusions of various kinds. But think of a doctor a dealing with real problem. You have a woman in childbirth and she's having terrible labor pains. Now the doctor, suppose the woman doctor, she doesn't say, well, I don't really know that this woman's in pain because I can't feel her pain. No, she doesn't say that. She knows perfectly well she's in pain. Well, the expression, uh, one of Bill Clinton's favorite expressions, I feel your pain, is really figurative. Yeah. One can imagine maybe wiring people together so that we really do feel each other's yeah. pain. And when we do that, have we moved something out of the realm of ontological subjectivity into the world no. of ontological objectivity? No, it's still ontologically subjective because you still have your occurrence of the pain and I still have my occurrence, even though they both have the same cause. Ah, but when you and I both look out the window and say, ah, it's a bright, sunny day, yeah. we're both having our own occurrence and yet that's, that's ontologically right. objective out the, there. Uh, stuff outside the window is ontologically objective. The experiences in our head are ontologically ah. subjective. And it's the ontologically subjective experience that gives us epistemically objective knowledge of the world out there. Now, here's another, uh, I'm sure, oft-raised uh, question or even objection to the idea of science studying consciousness. And that is, usually when science goes after something, it's because it produces something clearly and unmistakably observable in the world. Gravity is invisible, but it makes yeah. things move around uh, in certain ways. Consciousness, on the other hand, uh, does it produce anything that's an unambiguous and true and agreed upon sign of consciousness? Or could you imagine that all the behavior and all the action we see from supposedly conscious beings could be produced by an unconscious being? Yeah, and could. You could imagine constructing a robot that did all the things I can do without any consciousness. That's not how the world works. Uh, the way the world works is if you're going to be built like me and have the uh, uh, behavior that I have, you have to be conscious. But you could build a simulation. People build computer uh, models in artificial intelligence that aren't conscious at all, and they do some of the things that conscious people can do. And they're getting better. They're getting to the point where I'm sure they could fool a lot of people. You yeah, know? Uh, people are often tricked and have been um, uh, there was a, a robot doctor that would oh, answer, Eliza. Medic, Eliza would answer yeah. questions about people's <laughs> symptoms. But so what? I mean, I, there's still a distinction between having the conscious experience and behaving as if you had the conscious experience. So whenever you hear that they built some computer that can win at a game or something, remember, the computer isn't playing the game. It's just a simulation. For uh, most purposes, it doesn't matter if it's really playing the game or, or just simulating playing the game. But if you're talking about something that's psychologically significant, there's no psychological significance at all to these computers that can win at chess or play Jeopardy or anything of the sort because the computers aren't conscious. See, a real chess player has to know that she's playing chess, uh, that she began by moving pawn to king four, uh, that her rook is threatened on the left, on the, on the strong side. Uh, but the computer knows none of that because it doesn't know anything. It's not conscious. 
it goes through a series of uh, state transitions, a series of electronic uh, processes, which we can interpret as chess moves, but the computer doesn't know that. So all this talk about how the computers win at chess or win at Jeopardy, that's not literally true. The computer doesn't literally play chess. It's all in an observer relative fashion. It does something that we can interpret as playing chess. But when I'm thinking about chess, I'm really thinking about it. It doesn't matter whether or not people mm -hmm. interpret me that way. But uh, to go back to my question, um, for science, I mean, let's imagine a scientist, really hard-nosed, maybe sort of almost autistic yeah. scientist who has no real feeling, and this may not be fair to autism, but I'm just going to use this yeah. example, no real feeling for other people and is just looking for some phenomenon to investigate. What is it that they see in the world that convinces them that there even is uh, something called consciousness. Well, if it's a real scientist, it has to be conscious. He has to, he or she has to be conscious. <laughs> ah, so by reference to oneself. Well, I, the best way to know that a system is conscious is to be that system. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I know that other systems are conscious. No question. My dog is conscious. I don't have any doubts about this that. This is Tarski? This is Tarski, yeah. yeah. There's no question Tarski's conscious. You want to see a conscious dog, just come to my house at dinner time. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, there isn't any real doubt in, in a real life case that other beings other than us are conscious. But in my own case, there's no distinction between it seeming to me that I'm conscious and being conscious. If it consciously seems to me that I'm conscious, I am conscious. Yeah, and you can't make the illusion reality distinction for the very existence of consciousness. Yeah, you, I wanted to quote you because I have actually run into people who say, you know, science is teaching us that maybe consciousness is an illusion. and uh, It couldn't be. And yeah. I, uh, you put it this way. Um, you cannot show that it is an illusion in a way that sunsets and rainbows are illusions because if you consciously have the illusion that you are conscious, then you are conscious. Absolutely. I like that. I do too. The yeah. illusion-reality distinction presupposes the distinction between how things consciously seem to you and how they really are. But, the, but where the existence of consciousness is concerned, you cannot make that distinction because your conscious illusion of consciousness Consciousness is the reality of consciousness. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I think I like that. Yeah. But, but you're sure Tarski, your dog, what kind of dog is he, by the way? He's a Bernese mountain dog. Oh, he's a big guy. A big dog. Yeah. <laughs> you're sure that he's conscious. Now, what if I invented a Tarski robot that looked yeah. and behaved exactly like him? You, yeah. you, John, would say, that's I could Tarski. Be he's yeah. conscious. I could be deceived. So why should I trust you about Tarski? Well, it's very simple. I, I know that Tarski is not a... I, a doggy robot because I know, roughly speaking, how he's built. I don't have to have a, a fancy theory of dog physiology, but I can see he's got nose and he's got a body and he's got skin and ears and his way he eats with his mouth and he wags his tail and runs around. So I can see that he is relevantly similar to me and to other human beings. Now, if you get far enough down the phylogenetic scale, you get to fleas. I don't know if fleas are conscious. I have to let the experts decide that. But with my doggy, there's no question he's conscious. If somebody's got a theory that he's not conscious, I know it's he, they're mistaken. However, of course, I could be deceived as I could be deceived about anything. Mm -hmm. But in, in Tarski's case, we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> you know, there isn't any real doubt. Is he named after your former colleague, yes. Alfred Tarski? Yes, all my dogs are named after philosophers. Uh, they are Frege, Russell, Ludwig, uh, Gilbert after Gilbert Ryle. And uh, I needed a dog in a hurry because my puppy died and I was heartbroken. And uh, my breeder said, the only good one is in Poland. So Tarski was flown in at the age of three months as a puppy, flown in from Poland. And poor guy, like the rest of us, he had to change planes in Frankfurt. He flew on Lufthansa. Apparently, they took good enough care of him. So Tarski was flown in from Poland, and I had to have a Polish name for my doggy. And the other Polish philosophers I know are Kotarbinski, Lukashevitz, Kolakowski. You can't run around my neighborhood shouting, Lukashevitz or Kolakowski. <laughs> so Alf, it had to be Alfred. Now, I was, I was embarrassed to name a dog after a guy I knew, but apparently his uh, children are not offended by that. Oh, so that's anyway, good. That's good. the children in my neighborhood run around shouting, that's Tarski, and they're not referring to Alfred, the famous mathematical logician, but to my doggy. Was, uh, was Alfred a friend of yours? Yes, he was, yeah, and he was. Well, he's one of the greatest logicians that ever lived. I mean, uh, I've heard him ranked with Kurt Gödel and others. Well, if, if you name the great logicians, it's a very small list. It goes with Aristotle, I guess Leibniz, Frege, 
Gödel, and Tarski. That would be your first five. Wow. That would be the starting five. That's wow. pretty good. Yeah. What was it like to know a guy and, and, and I assume collaborate or, you know, sort of exchange ideas with a guy who was such a brilliant logician? Well, we never really talked much about our work. Uh, we knew each other socially and uh, we talked about uh, various intellectual matters, but I never actually worked on him with his formal uh, mathematical stuff. We did discuss a few uh, philosophical points, but but he was a friend of mine socially, not a collaborator intellectually. So you believe that science can and should investigate consciousness. I'm wondering what um, what would a scientific account of consciousness look yeah. like? Okay. I mean, a number of scientists are yeah. trying yeah, to find quite the... a lot are, in fact. They are. It's a booming field right now. And one way to do it would be to simply try to establish what has to go on in the brain... Yeah that distinguishes a conscious state from an unconscious state. So yeah. what parts are active when we're awake and alert yeah, as opposed exactly. to, you yeah. know, comatose? Look, in the history of science, uh, investigations like this go through three stages. First, you find a correlation. I think of the development of the germ theory of disease and Semmelweis finding correlations in Vienna. Uh, okay, you find a correlation between the consciousness of the subject and certain activities in the brain. Then secondly, you find out if that correlation is causal. Can you? By the way, these correlations have a name. It's called the neural, neuronal correlate of consciousness, the NCC. So you find the NCC. Then you find out, is it causal? And you do that by the usual methods. Can you turn on consciousness in an unconscious subject by turning on the NCC? And can you turn it off by turning off the NCC? That's stage two. Then stage, T, stage three is you try to get a theory. Why does this process produce consciousness and other processes don't produce consciousness. If you think of the development of DNA or the germ theory of disease, this is how we did it. You find correlations, you find the causal mechanisms, and then you get a theory about how the causal mechanisms uh, produce uh, these phenomena. Now with consciousness, we're still in the NCC stage. We're still finding neuronal correlates. And the um, the best methods now, I think, are probably the MRI, fMRI methods, the functional magnetic resonance imaging. And it's pretty nice. You can put the, the subject in this uh, machine, in this magnet. And I've been in these several times. And then you crank on the magnet and you get a picture of what's going on in the guy's brain. So you can <laughs> see quite a lot. Mm. And the funny thing is we do have a lot of NCCs, but we don't know quite what's what. That is, the problem we're having is that the unconscious brain looks an awful lot like the conscious <laughs> brain. And so we are making some progress, but it's slow. We got a long way to go. I would agree with you. I'm no expert, but uh, the fMRI is very crude. You're looking at millions or more neurons yeah, and neurons, connections right, yeah. at a time. We still don't know. I say we. I mean, they still don't know. What is it that... Uh, what is the actual functional substrate? Is it the network? Is it the yeah. firing pattern of the uh, neurons? We don't know. Don't I know. Mean, if you read the standard textbooks, they make it out as if we all knew that the neuron was the functional unit. Yeah. But that not, may not be it. That might be like saying, well, the molecule is the functional unit in a car. Yeah, it's exactly. Not. No, yeah. it's big systems of molecules. Exactly right. Yeah. And it may well be that it's not neurons that produce consciousness at that level, but at a much higher level. Uh, neuronal maps or great clouds of neurons or interactions between uh, uh, neuronal systems. We're, we're still uh, in the dark. We, st we don't know the answer to these questions. But the point is, notice something interesting. The way you and I have been putting this, these are questions you can answer. It's not like uh, the Cartesian, well, you can't ever know what's happening in the soul. Mm. That's not it. We're not talking that way. We're talking about actual biological processes going on in human and animal brains. And that suggests to me that it's a solvable problem. Well, once we get to the point where, let's say, we've gotten pretty exact about the correlate, we can say these are the conditions in some precise way that distinguish a conscious person from an unconscious person yeah. or, a, or even some gradations like yeah. semi-conscious, right? Yeah. Then there's this huge other boulder to move, which is the theory, which consciousness isn't like DNA, which, you know, by, we have... We have so much um, understanding of how information can be translated that once it was figured out that DNA encoded information, that, I mean, anybody can understand, really, anybody can understand how you translate or transcribe yeah. DNA into RNA into protein, right? Yeah. On the other hand, consciousness isn't like that at all. Well, it isn't, but then neither is life. And it, we're getting an understanding of life for a long time. People thought, well, you can't explain life. 
in terms of non-living matter. That's what we're doing. We're explaining life, and we're a long way along with that one. Mm. Uh, you explain the processes that constitute life in terms of other processes, and that's what we hope to do with consciousness. We haven't done it yet, but life, we don't fully understand that. How did life begin on this earth? We still don't know the answer to that. Uh, and what are the uh, exact, what is the exact characterization uh, that constitutes life? That's still pretty tough. Now, it's much harder with consciousness, but we're getting there. Um, you've said that consciousness is physical, which is why yeah. science can investigate. What I'm really saying is forget about words like physical and mental. They're obsolete. Ah, Please explain, because okay. I think this uh, distinction, so much trouble this this? distinction well, bedevils us. Yeah, we've got two traditions that pretend to be in opposition to each yes, other, but in yes. fact, they both make the same mistake. First, there's the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality that says consciousness is not part of the physical world, so it can't be investigated by science. Then we have the tradition of scientific materialism. Guess what it says? It says consciousness is not part of the physical world and it cannot be investigated by science. Then they add either it doesn't exist at all or it's really uh, just a, a particular neurobiological state of the it's brain. It's an epiphenomenon. Yeah, an epiphenomenon. Okay, both of these make the same mistake. Both the tradition of scientific materialism and the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality make exactly the same mistake. And that's the mistake of denying the obvious fact that we're biological beasts and that our consciousness is part of our biological history along with digestion and the secretion of bile and growth and uh, mitosis and meiosis and all the rest of it. That is, that we're talking about certain kinds of biological processes and some of those are conscious processes. That's where you start. We find it hard to do that because on the one hand, there's a tradition that says consciousness is not a part of the physical world at all. It's part of the immaterial soul and the soul. God attaches the soul to the fetus. God knows how, but he does somehow attach the soul to the fetus. And then there's a rival tradition that makes exactly the same mistake that says, well, consciousness couldn't be part of the physical world. So maybe it doesn't exist or something else or whatever. Now, what we got to do is start with the facts. And the fact is all normal human beings are conscious. Their consciousness is a biological process. It goes on in the brain. It's caused by certain specific, though still largely not understood biological processes. And it exists in the brain as a higher level or, or system feature. Forget about the traditions and go with the facts. But it's very hard for us to do with that. It's very hard to forget about all the traditions. And much of our discussion has been part of this, I think, hopelessly mistaken tradition that tries to treat consciousness as not an ordinary part of the rest of the biological world. Now, one of the reasons it's hard is we have the vocabulary of the mental and the physical. And these, are, uh, these trade on each other's mistakes. So mental means not physical and physical means not mental. Forget about the vocabulary. Just get rid of it. I have a friend from Kenya who tells me that in his native African language, you can't even state the mind-body problem because they don't have words for it. Well, we're stuck with these words. And, we're, and if you hear words like mental and physical, um, uh, you think, well, you know, they must be opposed to each other. They're not. It's hopelessly confused. By the way, this has practical implications. Many doctors think that if you've got a disease that can be cured by a placebo, there was nothing wrong with you in the first place. That's a horrible mistake. The only medicine that really works for me is placebo. I usually try to get the doctor to give me a good placebo. Uh, but they, 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 these doctors accept a kind of dualism, that if you uh, get cured uh, by a placebo, then there was nothing wrong with you. That doesn't follow. There was something wrong with you. Because uh, the, the so-called mind is part of the so-called body and better to get rid of this vocabulary. If you feel bad, there is a malady. Absolutely, yes. Um, so the old distinction between things that are solid and real and yeah. things that are mental and notional, that yeah. are figments, yeah. is part of our trap that it's we've part fallen of the into. Tradition. Absolutely. There's uh, a funny aspect of this, and Marx thought we have to have a materialist account of history. And what do you mean by materialism? Money. Money is the most abstract thing there is. It's not physical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's purely, I mean, what should we say, spiritual? Exchange value. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, so the idea that, um, well, we get it from Descartes, well, there are these physical objects and they're three-dimensional and you can hammer nails into them. And then there's the soul and it doesn't have a spatial dimension at all and you can't hammer any nails into it. That's a disaster. And we're still struggling with trying to overcome that.
So, John, um, if ideas are real, is anything unreal? Oh, sure. What's They're unreal? Not, well, uh, for example, we now have pretty good evidence uh, that when I see uh, the uh, rainbow, there's no real arch in the sky. It's ah. an illusion. Ah, but in my um, ontologically subjective world, it's yes, it's an in experience. Your ontologically subjective world, you have a visual experience whose condition of satisfaction are that there's an arch in the sky, but it's mistaken. There is no arch in the sky. What there is is water vapor. And the water vapor refracts light. Ah, uh, so the description is unreal. There's something. No, the thing, the, the thing that the description purports to describe is unreal because it doesn't exist. Uh -huh. What actually exists is water vapor. Uh-huh. And water vapor doesn't really exist because it's subatomic particles. Well, that's wrong. It does <laughs> exist. I mean, you take away the water vapor and you take away the illusion of the rainbow. It's uh -huh. just that the illusion is an illusion. There's no real arch in the sky. Uh-huh. When do you have your best thoughts? Do you have any? Oh, almost never. <laughs> I was going to say when observing Tarski, probably. No, I sometimes, uh, you know, you get odd thoughts in odd circumstances. I was once walking in Paris along, well, it's not even a street I like very much. It's the Rue Aubert, and it's not far from the Avenue de l'Opera. And I suddenly got a thought that led to a book, uh, and that's just how things happen. You just, what was that thought? Well, the oh. thought was that I had in my earlier book underestimated the constitutive role of language in the creation of human civilization, and I now see exactly what it is. But that's, I mean, now I'm giving a, a short summary of it. I, I took a book to spell it out. Mm. Um, anyway, so that's the kind of thing. You get a sudden ideas where things come to you. Other times, you don't get an idea like that. It takes a long time. Once, uh, once I was working on a book, oh, that cost me a lot of work, that book. I was sitting in the bathtub and I suddenly saw all the relationships. They came clear to me. And so I got out of the tub. This is before the age of computers. And I carried an electric typewriter into the garden, put it on a picnic table, ran a wire out, and typed out uh, the ideas. And I have that in a frame because it made possible another book that I wrote. Uh, the frame's up there somewhere um, of that particular. That was a book called Intentionality. Do you mind if I take a look? Yeah, sure. I'll show it to you. Okay. Once I understood these formal relations, I saw the structure of intentionality. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was in 1983. <sighs> oh, I love this. Uh, there's something special about seeing the idea in its original. That was the original form. Its original sort of material form. Yeah. Um, what I'm looking at is a, it's, it's a horizontal piece of uh, typing paper. You've got the words typed out, but you've also got lines connecting these things, which it says, do you mind if I read a little tiny Go bit? Go ahead, sure. Uh, at the very top, it says, a comparison of the forms of intentionality involved in seeing a flower and remembering seeing a flower, AMD, and then you've penciled in prior, intending to raise one's arm and raising one's arm. I-N-T, intention. Intention. Yeah, the, inten the prior intention and the intention and action to raise one's arm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You had that in the bathtub, but then you went out in the garden where there were flowers, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and this held up, this this yeah, set of worked. relationships. I, I published a book about that, and that's the, uh, the way the key page in the book. If you understand that, you understand an awful lot of the book. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, you said a moment ago that, that part of the whole false distinction that governs a lot of our thinking and most of our debates about the issues we've been talking about between mind and matter, between the physical and the mental, yeah. use all these oppositions to describe it, is partly due to our vocabulary, our habits. Yeah. Would it be worth trying to invent a new vocabulary? Well, efforts have not been successful. I mean, Heidegger has a new vocabulary, but it's not very helpful. I remember so it. So when I, <laughs> I think about this, uh, am I, would I be better off if I, instead of talking about the mind and the body, if I said, well, here I am. Um, I, I have the Befindlichkeit and the Gewaffenheit of Dasein in the Lebensfeld. I don't think that's very helpful. You know, I got as much uh, Gewaffenheit. That means thrownness. I got as much thrownness as an ex guy, and Befindley kind of means foundedness. So here I find myself in a bar, and I'm thrown into the bar, and so I got Befindley Kite and Gewarfenheit, <laughs> but it doesn't help me uh, to use this uh, vocabulary. Some people think it's very helpful. I don't get any very, uh, very far with it. You do have your, you do have one word you've introduced though, and I think it's is it glog or yeah, but that was a, a deliberately intended as a non-word. It's a fake word. Invent a word glog to name a character of your experience, 
And now, well, how does that character of the experience relate to the world? And so I just use the word glog to name a certain kind of experience. The experience of red. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you've been teaching here at Berkeley since... 59. 59. 59, yeah. You must love teaching. Yeah, I do. I like teaching. I tell my um, colleagues or I tell anybody who will listen that teaching is like sex. If you, <laughs> if you don't like it, you won't be any good at it. <laughs> so you have to like it. I like it. You said in a lecture once, and maybe you said it more than once, often you have to teach yourself to be less sophisticated. Yeah, that's right. Especially at the beginning of a philosophical problem, you have to be completely naive. You have to think, oh my God, I actually see things. From where I sit, I can actually see objects. Now, any sane person takes that for granted. But in philosophy, you have to be astounded by what any sane person takes for granted. And then later on, you become very sophisticated. And there's no algorithm for settling when you should stop being simple-minded and start being sophisticated. But eventually, you have to become sophisticated. But you start off naively. You start out in a childlike vein. Do you put yourself in that state? Yeah, absolutely. Every now and then? In fact, I'm always in that state, really. I'm always astounded that you make these noises through your mouth and I make these noises through my mouth and we understand each other. How the hell does that work? That's the philosophy of language. Or I open my eyes and I see these objects. How does that work? All of that is what makes philosophy go. Plato said it's a sense of wonder. Well, thank you for this astounding conversation, well, John. Well, thank you for your great uh, sophistication in asking questions. John Searle is the Slusser Professor of Philosophy at UC Berkeley. His many books include Intentionality, Minds, Brains, and Science, The Construction of Social Reality, Consciousness and Language, and his